Melbourne Comics, where outstanding figures from the world of comics choose uh, five books or graphic novels to take with them to a desert island, as well as a luxury item, a biscuit and a bag of crisps. Our guest today is a writer, but writer is really too small a word for him. He's more really, he's a powerhouse of unstoppable creativity, creating comics, novels, novellas, as well as TV shows, and even his own annual literary festival. He's written at least nine Doctor Who novels, as far as I can tell, and more recently a series of novellas entitled The Witches of Lichford. He is the science fiction fan who ended up as captain of the Enterprise. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Cornell. Hello. Hey, nice to see you. And not lovely to see you. I'm going to throw you right in at the deep end, Paul, and say, what is your first choice to take to the desert island? Well, I think we should begin with um, Asterix. Um, Asterix and the Mansions of the Gods is the title I've picked. But honestly, it could be any one from about a dozen different Asterix titles from my childhood. The storytelling in Asterix by Goscinny and Odizo, um has influenced everything I've done. Really? Um, in what way? Well, I think they have such a good handle for building plot based on character. They build tremendous running gags and uh, The Mansions of the Gods is uh, what happens when the Romans build a uh, new block of luxury housing apartments nearby and attempt to colonize the Gauls by uh, luring them with the Roman lifestyle and for quite a while turn the little village into a tourist trap selling knickknacks to the Romans. If you, if you read it now, the, the sort of satire of sort of, for example, estate agents lingo seems just as fresh now as it did when it was written in the 1960s, which I suppose doesn't reflect particularly well on estate agents. Well, well, Anthea Bell, the English translator, is responsible for a load of this. You mentioned about the importance of running gags, and, and it's one of the things that I felt sort of fell away in the, in the later Asterix books. Uh, it's not that they stopped doing the running gags, but um, I, for my book on Asterix, I did uh, you know, get to go and meet Uderzo and interview him. And he's, what he said, if I remember correctly, was there's all this expectation on me that I've got to put all of these running things in. And if I don't include, for example, the pirates, then mm. I'll get complaints from some fans. And things. So I've got to get them all in. And I, and I thought at the time, that's really sad. That's not the, mm. really the way to think about a running gag, is it? Mm. And, and also, you know, the, the good books in the series, the, the, classic run, vary things a lot. They don't think they have to hit the same button every time. I mean, it's, it's actually not great to hear that Uderzo, towards the end of his life, um, started going with the fan reaction rather than his own creative impulse, you know? Um, one of the things, of course, that you do see that, that you have clearly been inspired by is that um, you do write series of things don't you, you contribute mm. a series you write mm. series of novellas um mm. and um i i would imagine that that you know asterisk and things like that are, are hovering somewhere in the background of that but um what is it for you that is the appeal in writing series of books as opposed to you know many writers write a one-off book and then something completely different after that I think the appeal of a series is that you build up this fondness with readers. You get a recurring readership who will come back for more of the same. And you can play on those expectations and, and confront them and do something different with them. In terms of um, Asterix, it, it's usually, um, uh, again, a place, but sometimes it's a situation. He becomes a legionary. Isn't that fun? Let's see what we can do with that. Right, so, so it's, it's creating sort of variations on a theme. Mm. And, and is that what you've done in some of your recent work, like with the, the Witches of Lichford? Um, yeah, I mean, um, each book is about something. Um, like the um, third one, um, A Long Day in Lichford, is uh, about Brexit, basically. Um, it's about the, the small, the small Cotswolds town being um, 
torn apart by the results of the referendum and how that lets in occult forces that prey on that. Um, that's kind of at the heart of a lot of my work, the two strands, the really realistic and the, the high fantasy playing on each other. Do you find it easier creating a comic or a novel? Or oh, they're both, <laughs> both very challenging in their own ways and different gears in your head. Um, you know, the way they handle time. Um, between those two forms and television, I have to very consciously switch gears. But just lately, during the lockdown, I have felt so powerfully to be a member of the comics community. And what's been going on? Um, just the way that we're um, supporting each other and uh, doing charitable efforts for comic stores and things like that. And my own collecting has kind of gone upwards during this time as well, because it's a, it massages the autistic parts of my brain. And I say that specifically, my son is autistic, so I figure that genetic load must come from somewhere. I, I, I walk in three or four worlds, comics, prose, television, and Doctor Who. And balancing those has always been at the heart of, well, of who I am and what I do. It's, it's quite a difficult balancing act. And what, what is it that you collect? You say you're collecting them. Um, Master of Kung Fu, uh, Tomb of Dracula, um, Avengers Volume 1, a uh, variety of other small things. Marvel team up for some reason, just because I loved it as a kid. Right. I, I figured because there were two heroes in each of them, um, that was better value for money. I, I, I remember um, in my teens being utterly obsessed with the work of Paul Gulassi oh, in yes. uh, Kenji, Master of Kung Fu. Gulassi's artwork somehow seemed so different from everything else that was being done. Lithe and dark and sort of rich. Uh, I, I, I think they're kind of vertigo before their time often. That issue where Shang-Chi and Liko spend an entire issue just doing a jigsaw. Oh, God. But don't you think that it's, it's moments like that when, when, um, when the creators of something chew, feel so confident with, the, with their creation that they take that step and, and, and say, not just let's have a variation, but let's just really try something different and feel safe that the fans will go with it. Mm. Like, I mean, I personally think of um, Steve Gerber uh, writing an issue of Howard the Duck where he didn't have any artwork in time. So he just wrote a big essay about him having a conversation with Howard while driving his car across America. Mm. Um, and people argued about it for months afterwards. And I was just in awe. Don't Gerber's are in a different league from all of us. I mean, he is the best. The, his interaction with the real world, the way that um, he's really interested in how everyday people tick, and he's interested in centering the comics um, away from the world of superheroes with these everyday people who are looking at them and going, wow, those guys are kind of absurd. I just wonder if this is something that you yourself do in your work. Like, so, I mean, for example, when you take um, a character or a series away from its sort of its mainstream exposure, like in TV, like, it sort of gives you license to play around the edges like that. Oh, yes. I, I, I just did... Um, I just did a Star Trek Year 5 Valentine special this year, which is, um, I've always had in the back of my head a, um, a, a romance for Captain Kirk that goes across his career with another captain, because we, don't, we never see him with an equal like that. And um, I got to write it, uh, thanks to um, IDW and the Year 5 people. And uh, I was really pleased to do that. Great artist, um, Christopher Jones who's got this way of um, getting great likenesses for licensed characters who then move like proper comics characters. So let's move on anyway. You've got Asterix. Um, yeah. What's your second choice going to be? When I was young, um, I didn't get to know my elder brother for many years because he was m much, much older than me. And he was actually off visiting Australia for some years while I was a child. And he left behind in the attic boxes of magical treasures, um, books from the 1950s, uh, runs of if worlds of science fiction and galaxy. 
And uh, amongst all that were eagle annuals with amazing uh, full colour painted dandere strips by Frank Hampson. They were the most luxurious looking, most plushest comics I had ever seen. And the world building was terrific, but it was building on a world which I could recognise as being my parents' world, which had slightly gone by the time I was seeing these. And that was a really interesting combination to me, this future that was already kind of the past. So the, the volume specifically I'm picking is um, the first of the recent Titan complete reprints, going from the very start. Um, it's building a, a world that looks entirely lived in, where every detail looks real. For those who, who may not know the earliest Dan Dare, can you tell us a little bit uh, about you know, where did Dan Dare come from? Where, what about Frank Hampson? Um, the Reverend Marcus Morris had an idea for, um, he wanted to do a, a children's comic that would be a, a, an answer to all these evil American children's comics. And um, so um, he pitched basically the eagle and got it running and it was an enormous success. And the whole front page was colour Dan Dare. And the, the world of Dan Dare is, is fascinating. It's um, a, an inhabited solar system, which at the start, human beings have not explored. They've only gone a very slight way into it, despite having an enormous space fleet. And space fleet is run rather exactly like the RAF. There's a world government that seems to be run from England. And one of the attractions of the strip is that in a kind of primitive um, early 50s colonial way, it actually is pretty liberal. There's, um, they take care to um, put people of colour into leadership roles and um, to, um, it, albeit in a very paternal way, to um, indicate that all humanity is genuinely equal. And they initially venture to Venus where they discover the Mekon. And gradually this expands to include a whole design solar system. The, one of the annuals, one of the ones I found in the attic, has a space Olympics with representatives from all of these planets competing. So it, it's just a tremendous designed world. Um, and Dan himself is, uh, he's parodied now, but actually he's funny, he's sweet, he, he takes care of people. And, um, you know, it's, it's a strip which values life in a way which, you know, just post-World War II, you really understand. Yeah. I, I, I love it to bits. Right. Uh, absolutely fascinating and a wonderful choice. Thank you. Mm. We've talked quite a bit about the, the, the work you've been doing recently, um, um, but you did for a while work for the big comics publishers as well, didn't you? Marvel and DC. Mm. When, when you go and start... Uh, sort of take on the story of a character that's existed for so long. Um, are you expected, so does everybody ask you this, are you expected to know everything about that character, to have read virtually the entire canon? Do they give you a sort of a, a precy or is it somewhere in between? It, it's somewhere in between. Um, I think it's about, at the time I was at Marvel, there was a kind of anti-continuity feeling abroad. So uh, I was discouraged from basing stories too much in, um, in existing continuity, which honestly I failed at completely. I'm, my Captain Britain run, which I'm hugely proud of, we even take the trouble to rescue somebody Chris Claremont had stranded in space in his second volume of The Man Thing 20 years before. Um, it, it, there's stuff in there that nobody cares about. Fantastic. Um, let's move on to your third choice. My next choice is um, a Doctor Who strip, um, The Tides of Time, um, by the great Steve Parkhouse and drawn by Dave Gibbons. This is in Doctor Who magazine and it's the first Peter Davison comic strip. Um, whereas um, Doctor Who on television um, was just starting to do the violent, gritty stuff. Um, Parkhouse is a beautiful English fantasist. And The Tides of Time is, is an extraordinary visual odyssey. It's um, about a um, demon bursting forth from, I kid you not, a, a pipe organ at the heart of the universe. 
the Doctor and a one-off companion called Justin, who's a knight, a literal knight in shining armour. We have some surreal experiences, uh, it, all amazingly drawn by Gibbons, um, which flow with a sort of dream logic. At one point, the Doctor breaks a mirror um, to evade a vampire, gets seven years bad luck, and goes in the TARDIS to seven years' time to evade it. Um, it's tremendous stuff. So um, it's, it's, got it's a, a good story, but it, does it have any particular significance in the history of Doctor Who beyond being a good story? It, it, it seems to be to be the moment where it becomes clear that Doctor Who can be told in radically different ways. And I think that inspired an awful lot of people in the fan fiction community because it, it, it was its own little universe unconnected to the TV show that was still obviously and passionately Doctor Who. And so fan fiction, which before that point had been largely concerned with filling continuity gaps and stories with twist, twist endings, became a lot more interesting and innovative and became about alternative tellings, about a, um, if you don't like what's on screen, tell it a different way. And I was part of that revolution. And those fanzine stories, that fan fiction, fueled um, the uh, books and audio plays and comics of the 15 years between the old show and the new, and then went on to fuel, to fuel the new show. Because the, an awful, there's a, this impulse that's still at the heart of Doctor Who fandom to catalog everything, to uh, put everything in order, and make sure it's all right and proper and sorted and done. And up until that point, we were told which stories were good and which stories were bad. And I still feel the pull of this. And, and it's extraordinary that um, a show which is about uncertainty and change, and about which we, ha we have very, very few solid rules. You know, we don't know what some of the stories were called on screen. We um, don't know what a companion is quite. We can't define anything, really. And for a show that is like that, to have the pull of um, the autistic part of my brain, let's put everything into boxes. Wow, that's a potent combination. It's two things that can never be together, desperately trying to be together. And I think after that, we found a balance somewhere between the two. But again, that's where a lot of my fiction comes from to this day. And that's comics influencing Doctor Who. Right. So would you say there's a sort of reciprocity existing there where the, the, the makers of the mainstream need the makers of the, of, the, of the fan material to, as it were, give them a, a, a wider view of the characters and also kind of to keep them honest? I absolutely think something like that is the case. It's hard to, there's no us and them there really in that the makers of the show since it came back have largely been fans. Yeah. Peter Capaldi, the actor, um, led a campaign to take over the Doctor Who Appreciation Society in the 1970s. He could have been the boss of the Doctor Who Appreciation Society. Yeah. And um, you know, Stephen Moffat and Russell T Davis and Chris Chibnall, all ancient fanboys. Um, and employed so many of us ancient fanboys as well. At the start of my writing career, it was not on to be a fan of anything. The fans were those people over there. That's the audience. You're not one of them. You're one of us. And now it's actually not really done not to be a fan of something. Everyone's a fan of something. Um, I think we're going to have to move on to your, mm. is it, where are we up to? Third? No, fourth. Fourth, fourth choice, yes. What's your mm. third, fourth choice? Well, something that was very important to me in the 90s, the um, um, initial Hellblazer run of Jamie Delano. Uh, wow. Um, again, influenced me so deeply. Did it, did it reflect your life at all? What was mm. going on there? In the, the chaos of my life at that point, absolutely. The way that John Constantine seemed to wake up in random places and n never being in control of his life, always seeking somewhere to be and um, something to do. I was also a, a practicing uh, Wiccan for a while back then. 
and it's not the same thing. Uh, I still like a bit of that. Um, but um, the, the, the way it portrayed the world I was living in, the Britain of the time, um, so precisely using powerful uh, fantasy metaphor, as well as just saying it out loud, um, that was really important. But it w wasn't uh, John Constantine um, a bit of a wreck? Yep, yeah, so was I. Really? Um, so what, 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 what went wrong? Um, uh, bad macho choices on my part. I say macho, that's not it. Bad misogynist choices on my part. Um, and drugs, um, alcohol, and um, a, a lot of guilt and horror and uh, anger and um, not understanding um, my own nature for one thing. The revolution in identity politics lately has been brilliant for me. Um, the ability as I see my son growing up as an autistic person to see how autistic I am too. And if I'd known that, if I'd recognised that in my 20s, and if I'd had anybody who could have described that to me, my life would have been so different. And, um, you know, it, it, Constantine, it, it, that voice, and it's a very British voice. And uh, of course, invented by Alan Moore, like many of the great things in the world. But Delano gave him some real roots. He, he feels like he really is from Newcastle. And um, yeah, Jamie Delano. Um, now, I, I wanted to hear a little bit about um, some of the other things that interest you beyond just sort of um, books and comics. You're uh, an expert, aren't you, in uh, Hammer Horror movies as well? Oh, I wouldn't say an expert. Um, I'm um, watching them in, um, uh, in UK release order and discovering some of the Hammers are actually works of staggering genius. The Curse of Frankenstein. Um, it has an Im immense psychological depth going on there. Um, Brides of Dracula, there's none more goth. That's beautiful high gothic fantasy on a, on a high level. Okay. You know, and there's, there's good stuff here. Okay. Um, there's, there's, there's are they really scary? Here. There's lots of mediocre stuff in the middle. Right. <laughs> they, uh, they yeah. get, they're really good at the start and they get really good again at the end. Okay. Hang on a second though, one thing I have never, I've watched a few hot Hammer Horrors, I've never been scared. No, um, one of my favorite things, uh, because I'm kind of a wuss these days when it comes to horror, and one of my favorite things is horror that's been drained of horror. And I don't find the Hammer movies scary, but I love the gothic atmosphere. Okay, we better move on to your fifth and final choice. What is it? I thought, uh, let's have something from the current um, batch that I've been particularly impressed with and I wanted to uh, point out um, These Savage Shores from The Vault written by Ram V. It's a conscious um, homage to Hammer for one thing but it's in no way nostalgic. It's a vampire story set in India during the Raj and um, it, the use of vampire imagery, the um, connection with uh, Indian history and mythology, um, it's just immensely detailed historical fiction with vampires in it. Um, it's um, beautifully painted and drawn um, and uh, just exqu an exquisite piece of work. Would you say it's also, you mentioned it's attention to detail, and that's something mm. that you've highlighted actually more than once during our talk. Mm. Is that something that is particularly important to you, attention to detail? Very much so. I love being in a position to put tiny things in place that might pay off later. And I appreciate creators who do that. The Vault are also very good at producing gorgeous collected editions, and there's a particularly gorgeous collected edition of um, of these savage shorts. Okay, well, that, that is an extremely uh, eclectic and, uh, and, in, and in terms of time, incredibly broad selection uh, of books you're taking with you. Um, Thank you. What's the uh, luxury item that you're going to add? Um, I would like a radio um, because I'm assuming I'll be able to pick up the cricket 
um, commentary from somewhere in the world. That's quite an assumption. <laughs> I know. Um, maybe it's a so if it's a fictitious desert island, we can say yes. Okay, we'll thank you up. very much. Okay, so uh, uh, have you always been a big cricket fan? Oh, yes. There's again a clash between two opposite things. There's a, a combination of the poetry of it alongside stats, a continually moving and changing parade of numbers that one can plug into and keep in one's head. So it's uh, massaging both the autistic and the anti-autistic parts of my brain at the same time. There's nothing like it. So now, um, yeah, what about uh, your favourite flavour of crisps? Well, this is a bit difficult for me because um, last year um, I had a bit of a, a health crisis and uh, my gallbladder went to bluey. And so um, I tried very hard not to eat things with lots of saturated fats because that would send me back in to, into the hospital. Um, there are various brands of crisps that satisfy my low fat requirements. And um, the lovely ridged McCoy's ones, particularly McCoy's cheese and onion, do me very well. Thank you very much. Uh, so does, uh, does this mean that you're going to have a, a problem with a choice of biscuit? Mm, I'm not taking a biscuit. You can have the biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there are very few biscuits that, in fact, I haven't encountered one. What, what do you like to eat then that we might be able to give you instead? Um, I, there's, a, um, there's a vegetarian uh, faux chicken ticker called the Cheeky Ticker, <laughs> which is, it's a supermarket brand. It's one of the most gorgeous things on earth and I could actually eat it. Um, so I'm, I'm very fortunate in that regard. <laughs> Okay, I am going to send you off with the McCoy's crisps and a cheeky ticker. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, would you please show your appreciation for Paul Cornell? Thank you so much for having me.